the quality of government is really just as important as um, uh, as the quantity of government, and in many respects, it will be more important. So this has to do with issues of how do you deal with corruption, how do you get better service delivery, how does the government basically function better, all right? So that's what we're going to deal with. So to begin, we really need to talk about why the government is different, and in particular, why is it uh, different from the, uh, the private sector, all right? But execution is important in both the private sector and the public sector. Uh, this is a supposed quote from somebody at Goldman Sachs. It's not the business plan, but the execution, that you can make money on almost anything if you can do it well. Uh, and I think that a lot of times uh, people in my field that do public policy don't spend enough time thinking about the execution part. And, you know, as as you're doing your presentations for tomorrow, it's important to remember that the execution plan is really critical to your overall uh, presentation. It's not enough just to have a good policy option. You've actually got to be able to implement it in the real world. So let's begin with this question. Why is the public sector different from the private sector? Because people in the public sector face constraints that people in the private sector don't. All right, anyone want to suggest some reasons why it's harder to do things in the public sector? Yes? Um, first of all, the decisions uh, usually take longer. There are. Uh, the decisions, uh, they, it takes a bit longer to, you know, it takes longer. Okay, to things are slower. Yeah. Because there are many different uh, levels, so and it's higher, higher. It's hierarchical, yeah. yeah. There's no really, there's less incentive, I think, okay. to do it fast and well. The incentives aren't, uh, aren't there. So in a business, you got a, just a plain money incentive. Like if you do a good job, your company makes money, you get a bonus, your salary goes up. That doesn't happen in the public sector. Yes. Especially uh, very fast finance. That, Okay, so your resources are constrained uh, in the government. Yeah. Larger group of stakeholders, interest groups. Yes, okay, so that's really important that the actions of a public official, uh, you've got a lot of bosses, right? You've got one boss in a private company, but actually you oftentimes have a lot of bosses and sometimes they don't agree with one another. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, they can take coercive uh, decision mm -hmm. and at the same time it's, it's it's not for profitable uh, for money. Yeah, okay. So a lot of what you're doing. And the fact that it's not for money means that it's actually hard to measure yeah, what it is you're doing, right? Because in a private business, there's just one metric. Are you making money? In the public sector, you're pursuing a lot of different goals, and some of them are hard to measure, right? Yeah, Dennis? I think it's also in the government's long term goals. Yeah. Okay, that's another aspect of the fact that things are difficult to measure, so sometimes things don't pay off. Like the Singapore water case we did, you know, it was going to be a decade before they'd actually be able to create the industry and so forth. Yeah, in the, some, okay, anything else? In the private sector, yeah, okay. The priorities are set according to political agendas, yeah. not to real elite. Okay. Yeah, and this is a thing that bureaucrats run into all the time, that politicians constantly want to tell them what to do, not just in terms of big goals, which they ought to be setting, but also just in the day-to-day -day management of their bureaus and so forth. Yeah. Uh, more, their actions are mostly criticized, because it's too open for public. Yeah, okay, so there's scrutiny. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, and actually, this is one of the most important ones, right? Most public agencies can't go bankrupt. And if you think about it, bankruptcy is one of the most important disciplines in the private sector. The fear that you're going to lose money and go out of business, right? That's what really forces you to get efficient. Uh, but public agencies don't go bankrupt, and therefore people don't have to worry about that, all right? They don't have that kind of discipline. So this is the uh, thing that Robbie was referring to, I think, I mean, about having many bosses, right? So in a publicly listed company, you've got one boss who's the owner uh, or the shareholders. They want something pretty clear, which is for you to make money. Whereas in a public agency, you've got a lot of different mandates from a lot of different people, and sometimes they're downright contradictory. For example, think about the Hyderabad Municipal Water and Sewerage Board, right, that we did the first day. What are the mandates of that board? Is there a clear single mandate for that board to do something? No, right? You got one mandate to do cost recovery, uh, make money, invest in new facilities, but then you've got another mandate to serve poor people, all the slum dwellers in Hyderabad. And you can't do both of those simultaneously. You can't serve all these customers that can't pay for the water and at the same time turn this into a money-making enterprise, right? And that's because of the politicians. The politicians are imposing contradictory mandates on the same uh, agency. Okay, so this is a big problem. You can't, in most public agencies, retain earnings, meaning, so what happens, those of you that work in the government, when you come to the end of the fiscal year and you haven't spent your whole budget, you've got a little bit of a surplus left over, what do you do? Well, no, you don't, usually you don't turn it back. You, that's, is that right? Okay. Well, maybe you fixed that problem in Georgia, but I'll tell you, in most agencies that I've been in, if you've got a surplus at the end of the fiscal year, you try to spend it because it doesn't do you any good and in fact it hurts you, right? If you go back to the finance ministry at the end of the fiscal year, you've got a surplus, what are they going to say? They're going to say, oh, we gave you too much money. You know, you can do the... Let's give you less yeah. next year. And they'll give you less the following year, right? So you've actually got a positive incentive not to be efficient. You're just going to spend whatever budget, uh, whatever budget you've got. Um, Okay, in Georgia, are, are civil servants unionized? They're not, okay, so that's an advantage that, that you've got. You've got a flexible labor force. Uh, in fact, right now, as we speak, uh, we've got this Supreme Court case uh, called uh, Friedrichs versus California Teachers uh, uh, Association. So most countries have public sector unions. You remember again the Hyderabad case? right? Uh, their municipal workers are unionized and therefore they resist layoffs, they can't be restructured without you know, going through a big political negotiation. California Teachers, the CTA, the California Teachers Association is the single most powerful lobby group in the state of California. I mean they're just, they're just I can't tell you how powerful these people are. Uh, in California teachers can get tenure, meaning you can't fire them after only two years of service. And there is a reform proposal put forward that you should increase this to three years. And the CTA put up $100 million in a referendum campaign to block this from, ha from happening, and they succeeded, right? So they still get tenure after two years, right? So this is what, you know, governments cannot oftentimes control their own, like in a private business, Sometimes you have laws saying that you can't lay off workers or you have to do it with due process and so forth, but in a really flexible economy, you should be able to get rid of workers that aren't needed. I mean, that's how you get efficient, but in the public sector, it's really hard to, uh, to do that. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so it's at least these four, these four factors that make the public sector a lot more rigid than the private sector. Yeah. There is another factor. If you make money for your own agency, mm -hmm. you can't keep it for you. You will have to redistribute it to other. Yeah. The well, that's the thing about you can't retain earnings, right? You can't, in effect, create bonuses for better performance. Uh, or, you, I mean, at the end of the. What, what I'm saying is like a productive agency, yeah. like telecommunication, mm -hmm. and it's related to public sector. 
Oh yeah, okay, so they get their revenues taken by the finance yeah. ministry and spent somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. no, that's right. Sure. That's right, okay. So basically the whole structure of incentives in the public sector is really different and it's not conducive to efficient operation. So the question is, given those constraints, what do you do? Okay, so this is the point where <laughs> I'm going to go, and actually it's, it's very similar to the, um, uh, you know, I'm going to make some similar points to the ones uh, made yesterday in the lecture uh, about the central bank. So in my view, all of management theory, everything taught in business schools uh, and in public policy schools uh, can be reduced to one central problem, which I think is ultimately an unsolvable problem, but a lot of the debates really uh, revolve around this, which is this question of delegated discretion, okay? In any hierarchical institution, you have to be able to delegate authority to lower levels of the organization. You just have to be able to do that. And you have to do that for a couple of different reasons. So the first one has to do with local knowledge, all right? Uh, there was a great, uh, Probably, the, in, in, in my view, the, the best article ever written by Friedrich Hayek, the economist, was one that he wrote in the late 1940s called The Local Uses of Knowledge. Um, so at that time, it wasn't clear to Western economists whether capitalism or socialism was more efficient as an economic system. Uh, if you wind the clock back to the 1940s, Soviet Union under Stalin had been the fastest growing economy in the world. During collectivization in the 1930s, it was a kind of forced industrialization where the Soviet state was taking peasants off the farm, putting them into factories, and they were growing at, you know, 9, 10% a year for the decade. And a lot of economists said, well, actually socialism is more efficient because capitalism involves a lot of waste, and in fact, it was very volatile. Uh, this was a period following the Great Depression when most capitalist economies looked like they were just flat on their backs, you know, high unemployment, uh, you know, very destructive period of economic turbulence. And so Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, who are today, they're heroes of the libertarian, you know, right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I guess someone like Kaka Bendukidze would have been a sort of a disciple of theirs, that the government really gets in the way and, uh, you know, that the, the minimal state is, leads to the greatest efficiency. So they were arguing, they had a big argument with people like Joseph Schumpeter, another great economist at that time, as to which of these systems uh, was more efficient in the long run. And Hayek, I think, won the argument. Uh, it wasn't evident at the time. But I think he won the argument, and he won it on the basis of this argument about local knowledge, right? He said, in an economy, like 99% of the important information is local in nature. That is to say, if you are a farmer and you're trying to sell your apples and, you, you know, there's not enough demand for them, who's going to know that? Is it going to be, you know, some bureaucrat in Moscow or is it going to be you that's trying to market your, uh, your apples? Or... If you're in a factory and you're a, a, a factory floor worker and you're trying to put a door on a car chassis as it's going by and the part doesn't fit, you know, who's going to know about that? Is it you or is it the vice president that's sitting in a glass tower at corporate headquarters? No, it's going to be the local person. And he said that's what's great about a market economy is that prices are not set centrally. They're set by a lot of distributed buyers and sellers, all of whom are interacting. And through price discovery, you know, they're, they're setting market prices that reflect relative scarcities, and therefore it reflects local knowledge. And if you try to set prices centrally, it's going to be hugely inefficient, right? So if you remember back to the days of the old Soviet Union, they had this office in Moscow called Goskomsyan, you know, the State Committee on Prices. So you had a bunch of bureaucrats, several hundred bureaucrats, that we're trying to set individual prices on all of the goods and, and services sold in the Soviet Union, which, if you think about it, was just completely crazy. Yeah. Uh, on this system of the Soviet Union, there is a very famous Reagan joke on the plumber. Yeah. So what's the joke? Uh, it's a long story, but the, the guy in Soviet Union there was a big queue on the cars. So yeah. Wanted to buy a car. 
It was a 10-year queue. So, and the guy comes uh, asking where, when his turn is to buy a car, and this Soviet bureaucrat uh, sits and says that, uh, well, you have to come uh, after five years, and you will get uh, your car. And this guy just looks out of the door and suddenly returns and says, after five years in the morning of the evening, <laughs> the bureaucrat says, come on, why, why are you asking me after five years? No, plumber comes in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Right, so if, you think about, so if you think about what central planning was trying to do, it was completely crazy in retrospect, right? So like a jetliner. Uh, a, a 787, a Boeing, or an Airbus modern jetliner, how many individual parts you know, does it take to make one of these products? It's, it's in the millions, right? If you count all the sub-assemblies and so forth. And can you imagine somebody in a centralized <laughs> office trying to allocate resources in terms of physical quantities you know, for three million different parts just for one complex industrial product? You know, it's, it's crazy, and so I think Hayek was proven right in that argument over time that the market economy is inherently more efficient because price setting ought to be done on a decentralized basis by people who are close to sources of local knowledge, meaning you know, supply and demand, right? And you can't do this centrally. And, but this is an argument that applies to bureaucracies as well, that uh, in a bureaucracy, the people that ought to have responsibility for a decision should be the people closest to local knowledge. That if, you know, the, the head of the organization, you know, if, if you have to go all the way to the head of the organization, like somebody was saying the problem with a public sector bureaucracy is it's slow, right? And why is it slow? It's because in many of them you have to go up these levels of bureaucracy, somebody at the top makes a decision, and then the decision has to travel all the way back down all of those levels of bureaucracy. And if you just delegate the decision making to somebody on the spot that has access to that local knowledge, you're going to be much faster. And by the way, this is true in the private sector as well. If you have an over centralized decision making you know, process, uh, you're also going to get into, into trouble. So companies can be big and bureaucratic and slow as well as, as public sector uh, organizations. So local knowledge is really important. You have to delegate. You have to delegate. And, and by the way, this is also important in terms of military doctrine. So the United States, after the Vietnam War, the US Army you know, had done very poorly in that war, and they did this big rethinking of how they train their officers. And one of the things they did was actually to look back at the kind of history of, of military command structures. And they borrowed a lot of um, concepts from the Wehrmacht, from the German Army during World War late World War I and, and then World War II, uh, they have this doctrine, uh, they have a doctrine in, that was developed by the German military called Aufstrag Taktik, which basically, in, in the United States, it's referred to as commander's intent or mission orders. And what that means is that American officers are taught, do not micromanage. What you want to do is to tell your uh, um, junior officers only the most general kinds of instructions, like you need to be across that river north of Baghdad by you know, 48 hours from now, but you do not tell that officer how to get there, you know, because you're not in the field. You know, you're not driving down the road and running into a patrol and deciding that you've got to take evasive action and all this sort of thing. And if a senior commander tries to do that, uh, you're not, you're not going to win the battle. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that the United States had such an easy time over Saddam Hussein and the two times that you know, it went up against him, because the Iraqis had this highly centralized command structure where junior officers were just terrified of actually taking decisions, because if it was the wrong one, the, you know, they would get punished. Uh, and there are several actual cases where you know, officers just you know, they tried to use their judgment, they were wrong, and then they got executed. And under that circumstance, uh, if you're going up against a much more flexible army, uh, you know, you're going to do better. And in fact, the army has this doctrine called the freedom to fail, where junior officers are deliberately not punished simply because they made a mistake. You know, because there's this understanding that you have to be able to give people initiative, the ability to innovate, 
uh, and if you punish them uh, for having been wrong, having taken a risk, your organization isn't going to isn't going to work very well. So freedom to fail is important. By the way, in Silicon Valley, this is a lesson that everybody has absorbed. You know, you have all of these startups, the majority of which end up as big failures, and the fact that you presided over a company that went bankrupt is not held against you. You know, if you say that you tried a startup in Silicon Valley, and that's on your resume, you know, you're still going to get a job because there's a kind of understanding that innovation requires risk taking and risks, you know, it's not a risk if you can't fail ever, right? So, um, you got to take advantage of, of local knowledge, you have to be able to delegate, uh, and you have to be able to make decisions quickly, right? So you have to be able to delegate uh, authority but the problem is, the moment you delegate, you lose control. And so that's the reverse side of it. If you delegate too much authority, uh, you're going to basically have problems. You know, the, your local agent may be corrupt, uh, incompetent, you know, make a lot of bad decisions. Sometimes you can delegate authority that'll destroy your entire organization. So I don't know if you remember, there was this, um, this very old, British investment bank called Barings, and you know this was like 15 years ago. They had this young uh, trading, you know, uh, trader who made such a large bet uh, on currencies or something that it actually destroyed the entire bank. And they were finally, you know, they went bankrupt as a result of this one decision, and they were bought by ING, and they no longer exist as an independent organization. So you can delegate too much. Right? And kind of the central issue in all organizations is how do you delegate, you know? How do you delegate and still retain some degree of control, uh, but take advantage of local knowledge and allow people to have initiative at lower levels and so on and so forth? And um, it's particularly a hard problem in the, in the public sector. Uh, and I think that this is probably true because Somebody said, you know, the public sector is under greater scrutiny a lot of times than the private sector. And this is something you see all the time in politics, that public agencies are not allowed to screw up. They, there's an asymmetrical, you know, so what's the last time, you know, you got water or power and, you know, there are no problems and you thought to yourself, Boy, am I grateful to my government for having provided me with reliable power and light. I mean, nobody, nobody thinks that way, right? You never, you never think positively when your government is working well. On the other hand, if there's a big pothole or the electricity goes out or you know something bad happens, immediately people say, "Oh, this is this is really intolerable. You know, this is this is a horrible thing." I mean, I'm struck in uh, just. I mean, if you travel a lot, you know, in developing countries, just things like road maintenance, they don't happen. They're, you know, it's, it's terribly inefficient because you drive somewhere. I'm, I'm sure you got lots of roads like this in the mountains in Georgia where the public authorities are not keeping the road paved. And you break an axle, it's very costly to private individuals. Um, and this doesn't happen in the United States. You know, by and large, in most American cities, we're pretty good at this sort of thing. But that doesn't prevent all of these Republican Tea Party people from saying, oh, the government's evil, you know, the government never does anything right, uh, it's just, you know, just the source of, of bad things happening, uh, and so forth. So there's an asymmetrical, you know, you don't get praise for good things, but you get blamed for bad things in the government in the way that really doesn't happen uh, in, the, uh, in the private sector. All right, so that's kind of a general, this is more kind of context setting. So again, so we're still doing this at a very abstract level, but I think that there's actually two approaches to thinking about how to fix these problems. And so one I would say is the approach of the economist. So what's, what's homo economicus? Like what's the basic model that economists use to describe human behavior? Yeah. So uh, a human being is, is um, thinking in terms of uh, his or her needs and wants to in terms of like how much economic gain I can get right. Uh, right. in individual things like that, basically. Right, so the, the homo economicus refers to the fact that economists assume that people are rational, 
you know, what they call utility maximizers. Utility really just means they want to maximize their incomes or revenues or, or whatever, right? Uh, and they're rational about this, so sometimes they will, for example, cooperate with other people because they calculate that that's the best way to, you know, get ahead themselves, but essentially they're selfish individuals. The unit in economic theory is an individual, a rational individual, all right? Uh, and that means that incentives matter, and by incentives we mean basically monetary incentives. People will do things for money, uh, and if you want to get them to change their behavior, you change their economic uh, incentives, right? Uh, and then finally, this leads to, in organizational theory, a uh, principal agent framework, which is now the one, that's the dominant paradigm that's used by economists for thinking about organizations, hierarchical organizations, and uh, what's wrong with them. So this is all fine. I think you'd be very foolish to uh, deny the fact that people respond to incentives, that they're selfish, that they think about themselves before they think about other people, uh, and so forth. But it's not the whole source of human behavior. And there's a, you know, there's an alternative way of thinking about what people do, which I would describe as the social capital approach, or it's one much more common among sociologists or anthropologists who have a kind of different starting assumption about what motivates human beings, uh, which is that they're basically social animals and that they don't just think about themselves exclusively. They kind of look around. They see what are other people doing? Do other people approve of what I'm doing? You know, am I conforming to the norms of my community and so forth? And I think that this is also undeniably a part of human behavior. So if you, you think about children on a playground, right, uh, they feel embarrassment. So why does a kid feel embarrassed? Under what circumstance do you feel embarrassed? It's all about just something. Well, but... Yeah, I think that's really it, that a kid... Yeah? Yeah, they don't want to seem different, right? And so especially like if your kid is going to a new school and they don't know the children there and they don't kind of know the social rules and they do something wrong and then the other kids make fun of them, like that's just the most horrible situation they can be in, right? That's, that's when they get embarrassed and nobody is taught <laughs> this stuff. You know, this is just natural. I mean, it comes naturally to human beings that we want to conform. We all want to look around and see, you know, what are other people wearing? Is anyone smoking a cigarette? You know, are, are we making jokes, you know, inappropriate jokes about women or, you know, gays or, you know, something like, I mean, there's all these, the norms themselves change all the time, right? But human beings are norm-driven animals. And so we kind of really worry about whether we are seen as, as conforming to the norms of, of people around us, all right? So this is a different way of thinking about people in organizations, that they're social animals, they follow norms, they like to be bonded to other human beings, and that's also a very powerful way of motivating them. And so sometimes these norms are actually more powerful than incentives, right? Sometimes you stay late at the office, uh, so you know, was up at you know 3 a.m. to get Catherine <laughs> to the airport this morning. So why is she doing this? You know, was the EPRC going to pay her a bonus uh, if she did this? No, <laughs> right? She's really dedicated to her job, and you know, so there's a lot of things that happen because you know you 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 feel that there's a certain standard of behavior that you need to reach, and it's not just because you're being paid or uh, being compensated for it. All right, so these are kind of two broad ways of thinking about organizational uh, behavior. So, you, so let's, we're, we're now gonna, the next few slides is all gonna be about the economist's approach, all right? That's the dominant one under which we've thought about public sector reform in recent years. So, principal agent theory uh, applies, you know, perfectly well in the private sector, uh, and this is what it looks like, right? This is a publicly traded company, meaning company that's issued stock to uh, outside investors. And so the principal is who? Shareholders, right? They are the legal owners of the company. And therefore, everything the company does is supposed to be in, uh, in their interest. 
and then the agents uh, exist at different levels. So the first level of the board of directors, the board of directors' responsibility is to appoint a CEO. The CEO then appoints senior management. The senior management then hire workers. And the authority travels from the principal up here through these different levels of agents uh, all the way down to the shop floor workers, right? And according to principal agent theory, the reason that this kind of an organization gets into trouble is because the agents at all these different levels have different agendas from the principal. You know, they are more interested in advancing their own private interests than the interests of the shareholders, and that's where you get corporate scandals. So, uh, you know, Enron, which used to be this big energy trading company in Houston, basically was forced into bankruptcy because one of its vice presidents, you know, started to skim money off and put it in a separate, you know, uh, account off of the books and nobody knew about it. So that's a kind of classic case of corporate corruption and, uh, and dysfunction, okay? So in a public sector uh, organization, a government, you have principal agent theory also, uh, and they're just a little bit different. So in a democracy, according to democratic theory, the principal is we the people. Right? The people are sovereign, they're the ones that get to decide, so they vote, uh, and this is a presidential system, so they alternatively vote for legislature and a separately elected president. If it's a parliamentary system, they're only going to vote for the legislature. The legislature appoints a bureaucracy. The bureaucracy can then appoint implementing organizations. They can outsource and hire contractors uh, and this sort of thing. But again, it's the same structure, hierarchical structure, so what is corruption? So corruption is when somebody down at this level decides that they're going to take a bribe rather than collect the fee, right? Customs agents, like customs is one of the biggest sources of bribery and, and corruption in a public agency. So what does the customs official do? They say, okay, your truck can go across the border. You pay me a bribe and I'm not gonna charge you the, you know, the fee. So they're basically stealing from the public uh, and they're enriching themselves, and there's you know, what economists would then call a misalignment of incentives, that the incentive for the corrupt official is different from you know, what the principal wants that agent to do. So if you're thinking like an economist, how do you use this framework? How do you deal with corruption, either in the public sector or the private sector? If the prop, yeah? Well, no, but how do you, so, but this gives you a kind of guide to how you fight corruption. If the problem is misaligned incentives, then how do you change people's behavior? You, yeah. make, it, uh, you, make, it, uh, you make it incentives for these people not to take a bribe, mm -hmm. but to do their job, and uh, you make it more valuable for them to stay at their Right, family. okay, so if everybody's being motivated by incentives. And you instill the culture. Also. Yeah. Well, okay, well, the culture part we'll, we'll get to, but I'm thinking like an economist, you know, they think that incentives are important. And therefore, if you want to prevent something like bribery, you've got to change incentives, right? And so, yeah. Oh, um, I would say that uh, the effective strategy is to make uh, the relationship more personal, where the business is not um, opportunity to actually yeah, well, corruption. So that is one strategy, which is simply to take away any discretionary authority on the part of these people, you know, down here, right? Uh, but the problem is, if you go back to the previous discussion about the need to delegate, sometimes you just got to delegate authority to people, you know, you got to trust them, you got to say, you're closer to local knowledge, and therefore you've got to make that, um, uh, that decision, and in fact, because people don't trust the agents to do the right thing, what's the usual response in a bureaucracy if you don't trust your, your staff to do the right thing? You start making a lot of rules, right? And what is it that people hate about bureaucracies? It's that they got too many stupid rules, right? Uh, and so one way of taking a, you know, one way of dealing with bad agent behavior is to proliferate lots of detailed rules, but then the moment you proliferate these rules, you eliminate you know, the delegation of authority and you slow things down and 
you know, it, it, the bureaucrat, you know, you say, well, you know, I really need this permit, you know, before January 30th because, you know, this big deal is coming up and the bureaucrat says, sorry, can't do it. The rules say, you know, you got to get these following permissions and I'm not going to bend the rules for you, right? So, yes, you can take away discretionary authority, but you pay a big price for that. So it's not that easy. But the main point is the theory would tell you the, re the real way you're going to do this is by changing incentives, by making it personally uh, more profitable for the agent to do the right thing with regard to the wishes of the principal. Uh, and under those circumstances, you can actually delegate a fair amount of authority. All right, so how does this play out in practice? So I would say over the last 25 years, there have been quite a number of efforts to essentially bring these market principles and theories into the public sector. Uh, and one of them was this um, effort, uh, uh, new public management. It starts in Britain. It's really first implemented in New Zealand in the, in the 1980s. So new public management basically treats government officials as if they're corporate executives, right? So the central bank governor of, uh, of New Zealand is hired uh, under a contract uh, in which performance standards are set in the contract. Uh, you know, he's only hired for a certain, you know, like five-year term. And in that contract, it actually says inflation has to be kept within a certain range, you know, by you. Uh, as part of your job description. And with central banks, it's actually quite easy to know whether they're screwing up or not. Uh, and if he doesn't meet the target, he's out, he's fired, right? And so that's a case where you're actually not controlling the agent by removing discretion. You're actually giving that central bank governor a lot of discretion, but you're saying, we're going to measure your performance very accurately, and if you don't meet our performance standards, we're going to fire you. And if you do meet them, you know, you may get a bonus. And so it's basically treating a public official as if uh, they were, um, you know, in the private sector, right? And so new public management involves a lot of other things, but essentially it's a trade-off of discretion for accountability, that you set accountability standards for your public officials and then you allow them to get to the goal, you know, however they, they see fit. Uh, and it worked pretty well in New Zealand. I mean, the performance of the New Zealand public sector over the last 20 years, they're constantly innovating, you know, they're taking new approaches to criminal justice, to incarceration, to uh, all sorts of things, you know, under this kind of approach. Yeah. Sounds very, you know, like it's easy to measure central bankers' performance, but how do they measure That's exactly, we're going to, we are going to get to that point shortly. <laughs> because this is one of the limitations of this thing, that you can only hold people accountable per, for performance if you can measure their performance. And in many parts of the public sector, it's very hard to measure uh, how well you're doing, all right? So uh, that's, that's one approach, and it's been tried in Europe. I mean, it's partly a cultural thing. This is a very Anglo-Saxon kind of, you know, Anglo-Saxon, culture really loves free markets and individualism and so forth. And so this has been widely adopted in places like Australia, Canada, Britain, uh, even the United States, uh, and it's less popular in continental Europe. Uh, so another approach uh, is to add an exit option. Uh, this is something that was advocated first by Milton Friedman, you know, another Nobel laureate, a pretty libertarian economist. So remember, on that list of why the public sector is different, we said one of the first things that's different is you can't go bankrupt uh, in a public agency. Well, Friedman said, well, maybe you should create the, the equivalent of uh, in a public agency. And he said, for example, with public schools, right now, public schools are a monopoly of the state. You know, most states don't have uh, any choice. Uh, parents have to send their their child to one particular public school, and if it's a bad school, they can't do anything about it. So how about we provide vouchers instead of forcing you to go to a school, you get the equivalent, you know, that you're paying in taxes, and you can put your child in any school you want. And so if your school is bad, you put them in another school that's doing better. The bad school will lose students, it'll in effect go out of business and close down, right? Have you tried this in Georgia? Yes. yes. Yeah, and how's it worked? Uh, 
quite successful, but then uh, um, so everybody should take into consideration that sometimes there are regions where you might have no schools at all based yeah. on this uh, yeah. system. So for instance, the mountains region, right? Yeah. So there is only one school, and so you do not have the choice mm -hmm. to go there and. Uh, or you don't, when, if you don't go there, then uh, those who can't leave this region, they will not have any education. So right, this, this right. Is, this is but small exception. Yeah. It was very successful. So this idea has been, you know, the basis for a lot of educational reform all over the world. In the United States, we've got both a voucher movement and a charter school movement to give parents more choice uh, and, and to create market-like conditions, you know, in, in this part of the public sector, it's very controversial. Uh, and in fact, most communities, there's so much political resistance to it that they actually haven't been able to introduce that much competition. But, you know, it's, it's been done in quite a lot of places. Uh, there is a, you know, my favorite development economist is a fellow named Albert O. Hirschman. He passed away about three years ago, but he wrote this famous book called Exit Voice and Loyalty about this exit option, and he said, you know, in the public sector, one of the ideas for reforming it is to add an exit option. Uh, this is like, you know, so you have this in stock trading, for example. You own shares in a stock, you don't like the way the management is running the company, so you have either the choice of going to the management and complaining, or you can simply sell your shares and get out of the stock entirely, then the price will go down and the management will get the signal that they're doing something wrong, and he said, well, does that work in the, in the public sector? If you exit out of the public sector, is that going to send the signal that the public authorities have got to do better? And he pointed out, not necessarily, you know, not necessarily, because sometimes uh, it's only, for example, in the school system, who are the people that are going to exit first out of a bad school? Is that going to be done by everybody simultaneously? No. It's, it's probably going to be done by the richer, better educated parents, you know, who are more attentive to what's going on uh, in the school, and then they leave, uh, the school gets worse because the better students are now out of that school, but the school doesn't disappear. It's still got, you know, the children of, you know, maybe the kids don't have parents, parents are drug addicts, or they're, you know, they're come from broken homes, they're not paying attention, and so forth. And so actually, the people that are left behind by the exiting uh, parents and, and children are actually worse off than they were uh, before you had an exit option. They say this is true, you know, for example, in American inner cities as well, that uh, in the 1920s and 30s, Harlem, you know, this black neighborhood in, in the middle of Manhattan Island was a really vibrant place. <laughs> Like Duke Ellington has this famous song called Take the A-Train, saying, you know, you take the A-Train up to Harlem, and a lot of white people back then, you know, would go to the Apollo Theater and go to hear jazz clubs uh, and so forth. And part of the reason for that was that there was residential segregation in most American cities, that black people were not allowed to move to, you know, middle-class white suburbs. Uh, New York didn't have official racial segregation like a lot of southern cities, but in effect, you know, a black person, even if they had the money, really couldn't buy a house in a white neighborhood. And so all the black middle class were allowed to stay uh, in, I mean, they were kind of forced to stay uh, in, you know, these, these um, you know, so-called ghettos. And then in the 1960s, you had the end of legal segregation. Blacks could now move wherever they wanted, and a lot of blacks exited. And so they moved to, you know, other suburbs and so forth. And who gets left behind? In Harlem, it's all the drug dealers and, you know, uh, criminals and so forth. And so you get this big decline in the quality of life in Harlem because people have been allowed to exit. And so that exit option is very problematic in some cases. Sometimes it actually, you know, can make things, uh, can make things worse. By the way, Harlem is now completely recovered. I was just amazed. I mean, Alan obviously knows this since he lives in New York, but uh, it's now return to the kind of status of having actually a middle class in it, because actually a lot of white people have started to move into, you know, kind of recolonize that part of the city. In fact, the, the uh, African-American population is now... Yeah, yeah. So,
So anyhow, that's the exit option. Uh, another one is uh, so-called wage decompression. So in many developing countries, uh, all civil servants are basically paid the same. Why are they paid the same? Because a lot of them are not actually being paid to do anything useful. They're just being given jobs as a matter of political patronage, right? And so a lot of countries just massively expanded their public payrolls uh, in order to pay off uh, uh, political supporters. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways of combating that was, I mean, this is what the World Bank was going around advocating for, for some time in the late 1990s, that you've got to give incentives for good work. So you've got to pay high-performing workers a lot more than you pay low ones. And you've got to be able to fire uh, incompetent workers. And again, this runs into a lot of obstacles because in a lot of bureaucracies, you can't fire workers. You can't punish them. The union negotiates a contract that doesn't give the managers any <coughs> authority at all to set wages and so forth. So there's a lot of pressure to create more flexibility in your ability to either reward or punish uh, people based on their uh, actual performance. Uh, another idea is basically outsourcing, right? So. This was a craze that really begins in the 1980s. Uh, and part of it makes a lot of sense, right? So you're a big bureaucracy, like you're the, I don't know, the finance ministry, and you've got a cafeteria, uh, and you're part, you, part of your bureaucracy is running the cafeteria. But you, know, <laughs> you as a finance ministry, that's not your main job is serving food. Your main job is managing you know, the nation's money and there's no reason to think that you're going to be particularly good at running a cafeteria, whereas if you outsource it to a company that actually specializes in food service, then you'll probably get better service, right? So this begins this big craze for outsourcing as many parts of the government. Sometimes it's outright privatization, uh, and a lot of times it's simply hiring contractors to do work that previously was done by uh, governments. Now, the theory behind this and you'll notice every one of these points, I'm giving you the theory behind it and why it should improve the performance of the public sector, but there's also you know, drawbacks to it as well. And this is what's kind of important to think through. So is unlimited outsourcing necessarily a solution to the problems of the private sector? Should, you, should a government be willing to outsource everything or are there certain key functions that should never leave the public sector? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, and why should you not outsource these? Okay, so sometimes the incentives of the private party that, to whom you're outsourcing are wrong. You know, you, know, you get a free riding problem. Uh, the United States in Iraq, if you remember, actually outsourced the protection of its own diplomats to essentially a mercenary army, you know, this Blackwater firm. Uh, and these guys carried, you know, weapons and they had the right to kill people. Uh, and so, in effect, the U.S. was outsourcing a military function, including the right to kill uh, and use deadly force to a private organization. And I think people at that point said, no, this is, there's something really wrong with this, because if the state is going to use violence, it ought to be the state, and you ought to be able to hold the state accountable for this and not some private contractor who's just trying to make money off of, you know, this particular activity. Or, Yeah, there was a big case where they started shooting and killed a whole bunch of Iraqis, and I think they were eventually put on trial, and uh, you know, and some of them were were convicted. But it it I think revealed, you know, this 
that outsourcing had really gone too far, you know, in, in this case, and that, uh, uh, you know, the government really should keep this function uh, to itself. But, to, yeah, they, they still use private, yeah, yeah. And there's other things where they outsource, you know, training and, uh, you know, lots of other things to um, private organizations, and it works, you know, some, sometimes private organizations will have capacities that the government doesn't have, uh, and therefore there's no reason that you shouldn't you know, do this kind of outsourcing. Research, yeah, so I used to work for an organization called the Rand Corporation, which is a private nonprofit think tank, right? And the, the Defense Department uh, hires the Rand Corporation to do studies of all sorts of things, because it doesn't have the capacity, and Rand sort of specializes as a, you know, as a public policy research institute. And so, you know, there are places where this sort of thing makes sense, but again, you got to be very careful in, in determining where. Uh, public expenditure tracking surveys, so this is, um, this is something that the international financial institutions have pushed very strongly. A lot of governments, particularly resource-rich governments, uh, it's a complete mystery what the revenues are, where the money is going. Like, you try to track money in Russia, you know, that's coming in from Gazprom and from, you know, Rosneft and all these big companies and how it's going through the public sector, where the money ends up, how it's being spent. All of that is completely non-transparent. And so one thing that the World Bank has specialized in doing is doing these so-called public expenditure tracking surveys. There was one famous one in Uganda where they traced money going to the uh, education ministry as it left the treasury, goes to the education ministry, and then they tried to figure out how much of that money actually went to frontline service providers, meaning teachers. And it turned out that about 80% of the money disappeared before a teacher ever saw any of it which meant that that other 80% was somehow being skimmed off, you know, as corruption uh, or to pay bureaucrats that weren't really doing uh, the work of education. And so, you know, more transparency permits better, uh, better accountability, uh, shortening the route of accountability, right? So we said, um, well, okay, so what's a long route of accountability? A long route of accountability is actually formal democracy, right? So let's say that I'm a parent and the, my local school is really awful uh, and I don't like that situation. Uh, what do I do about it under a kind of modern democracy? Well, you vote every few years for a member of parliament or for president. Uh, but how do you know which party to vote for that's going to make your little school better, right? I mean, that's a very long route and there's a lot of heroic assumptions that my vote is actually going to fix the problems in my local school. Uh, you know, the president may not care about my local school, that may not be on the radar scope of the legislator, so on and so forth. So that's a very long route of accountability. And the idea is, if I can vote for the principal or the school board in my neighborhood directly uh, and shorten the route of accountability, then I can send the signal about what I'm unhappy about. It's much easier to send that signal if you know, there's an immediate connection between my vote and the activity that's being uh, undertaken. Uh, and so this is, you know, this is one of the things standing behind a lot of the efforts to decentralize and delegate, you know, authority to local governments, municipal governments, even uh, neighborhoods uh, uh, around the world, all right? Uh, and again, this sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't, because uh, sometimes the local authorities, you know, they may be more corrupt than the national ones, or they may not be competent, or one thing or another. All right, so that's kind of a list of things that have been done in the last 20 years to improve the private sector. A lot of them have been attempted in Georgia, right? I mean, this stuff should not be completely unfamiliar because a lot of the public sector reforms, you know, that, that were attempted here fell under one of these uh, categories. So. They've all got something in common. They're all efforts to bring market-like incentives into the public sector to overcome those limitations that we talked about 
uh, why the public sector is different from the private sector. They all work primarily through incentives. You're trying to affect the agent's incentives to align them better with the, you know, the principal's uh, wishes. They mimic market mechanisms. Uh, and then the big question is, you know, to what extent do they work? Uh, and uh, so we've been actually discussing this question of whether they work as we've been going along because every single one of them, the theory, you know, tells you that it should provide good results. And in many actual real world cases, they have, but not always, right? And, and there are limitations uh, to many of them. And so this is kind of a list of what's, what, what are some of the limitations of this approach. So this has been brought up before. Uh, I think uh, by Rockley, a lot of things you can't measure, right? And if you can't measure performance, it's really hard to hold people uh, accountable. Uh, this problem of multiple principles. So principal agent theory assumes that there's one principal, that principal knows what he or she wants and then just gives orders to the agent to do that thing. But the Hyderabad case and you know, other things you can think of in, in you know, public life uh, tell you that that doesn't always happen. Sometimes there are multiple principles that are giving contradictory instructions and you can't satisfy all of them at the same time. Uh, yeah, that's right. So principles sometimes want downright contradictory uh, things. Uh, and then the theory doesn't really tell you about how much discretion you should delegate to any given uh, agent, whether it should be a lot or a little. So let me just go in a little bit more depth. So what's the problem with measurement? So this is another little two by two matrix. Uh, and this time what's on the X axis is uh, what I call transaction volume. That is to say, how many decisions uh, does a public agency actually have to make? And it goes from low to high. So down here, they don't have to make that many decisions. Up here, they got to make lots of decisions. And then on the y-axis, you have specificity, meaning how easy is it to measure uh, the activity uh, in question. And it's different for different parts of the public sector. So, for example, I would put different activities, you know, kind of in these different places. So, central banking, we talked about this already. That's one of the easiest things to measure, right? A central bank is in your capital city. It doesn't have a lot of employees. It doesn't make a whole lot of decisions. It basically makes periodic decisions on interest rates and managing the money supply and so forth. And you can see when they're screwing up because the rate of inflation starts to go up, right? Uh, so it's really pretty easy to hold a central banker uh, accountable. In Argentina, you know, central bankers not been doing a very good job. And so what, what did the government decide to do? It decided to corrupt the statistics agency and put its own political appointees in the statistical agency and pretend that there was no inflation. Whereas everybody in Argentina knew that there was a lot of inflation because they could just see the prices of everything uh, going up. So it's hard, to, it's hard to hide a failure of performance in something like central banking or you know, the more technical uh, things that governments do. If you've got a state airline or a telecoms provider or something, uh, you can actually you know, see pretty well whether it's working or not. But then when you get down to things like this, you know, primary school teaching, preventative medicine, guidance counseling, you know, it's really hard to measure. Like a guidance counselor is a really great example. Guidance counselors can be very important. You take a high school student and say, you know, you should do this career as opposed to that career. How do you measure the success of a guidance counselor? You know, you're not even gonna know whether they've given good advice or not for another 10 years because you know, the student has to do, you know, go off into a career track and you don't know what the alternative would have been uh, and so forth. Uh, and so you know, you're all from different parts of the public sector and so you can kind of put yourself somewhere in this matrix according to how easy is it to measure your performance. Like in the foreign ministry, how do you measure whether you're a great diplomat or not, right? It's difficult. Yeah. First quarter, second quarter, the activity, what has been achieved, what was the aims, 
but we wanted to achieve it, but through this feedback. Right. This would be some sort of Yeah, but then the trouble is if the measurement is outcomes, let's say you're the desk officer for relations with Russia, and the relationship, you know, is really bad and you're under your watch, is that your fault, you know? It may not be. I mean, it could be Mr. Putin's fault, right? So, it... Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. But the place, uh, you have to show maximum determination. You have to yeah. do everything possible, but it could be done in the future. Right. But you don't... Again, it's, it's really hard to know what's the maximum that could be done, you know? Another diplomat could be more imaginative, could have taken a different approach, you know, so there's, it's, it's a very kind of subjective, yeah, yeah, did you? But with, um, yeah, I just had a couple of questions about time of teaching. I think this is a more or less easy, easier task because you have uh, tests, for example, you can measure by tests and you mm -hmm. measure by how your country ranks against the other countries in terms of yes. education uh, according to international rankings. Uh, yeah, so there's more, been... We're running late. It's okay because I'm just eating into my own time for the next case. So we're just going to continue with this. But so teaching is a really good case where a lot of countries have tried to measure their performance by using standardized tests, right? Like the PISA scores and so forth, where you can compare yourself internationally. Uh, and that, you know, that works to some extent, but it's also difficult. Uh, in the United States, under George W. Bush, we started this national policy called No Child Left Behind, where all of the states were required to give standardized tests to students, uh, and then the education department, the national education department, would reward good performing schools and punish poorly performing schools, and Congress, just this past year, abolished the whole program, or it severely modified it because, uh, you know, testing, educational testing is difficult. Sometimes it actually doesn't measure really the student's ability. And a lot of schools were complaining that once you set up this um, incentive system, uh, the teachers only, they would only teach things that were going to be on the test, you know, and they wouldn't teach anything else because their whole pay depended on whether their students did well on this one standardized test. And, you know, so it, it, it in a way, it kind of shaped the incentives in, in, in a wrong way in, in, in certain cases. Tamar, did you have a comment? Yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, testing, I think that um, there's a lot of people who are interested in the test because they want to The idea is that the great majority uh, fits the system, I think. So you cannot make everyone happy at the same time. But what I wanted to say is that technically um, everything is measurable. Mm -hmm. It's just about performance indicators, how well you will be able to come up with the right performance indicators. So I believe that whenever this is created, it should come from the local context and mm -hmm. reality so that it's not just something very theoretical. Just like you asked um, Gigi about how, how do they measure their yeah. performance, it's very complicated and controversial thing to measure, but when determining the per performance indicators, you should come up with this local context yeah. in mind. Yeah. And there are certainly many areas where you can measure performance, like garbage collection or police, you know, um, the current uh, police commissioner in New York is Bill Bratton, and one of the things he did, you know, New York had this really horrible murder rate where 2,000 people a year were getting killed, and in the late 1990s and early 2000s, it started to go down, and one of the things he did was institute a performance measurement system where every police precinct uh, had uh, on a computer screen you know, all of the reported crimes in that precinct. And he would meet with all the precinct captains every single week, and they'd look at the numbers, and if the number of assaults or, you know, robberies or murders in your precinct went up that week, immediately he'd be on top of that person and saying, what did, you know, 
what did you do you know wrong how can you improve your performance and so forth and so you know yes so we got big data these days we can measure a lot of stuff and so that is an important way of keeping track of the performance of the public sector and i think a lot of effort has gone into computerized IT systems that can follow this stuff and then actually hold people accountable. But this just indicates it's a lot easier to do it up in this part of the matrix than it is down here, right? Just because it's, you know, you got more transactions uh, that you got to follow and it's just harder to actually measure things, okay? Let's uh, continue. So this is a problem, multiple principles. We don't have to go over this, but a lot of times the instructions that you get from the people is really confusing <laughs> uh, because the people want uh, different and contradictory things. And so if you're the bureaucrat here that's getting all sorts of contradictory orders from the president, from Congress, from different levels of government, then you're not going to know what to do. Um, so we now turn. Uh, yes. So, uh, can you go back to the previous one? In the, in the more developed countries, don't you think that the, the media and civil society have played a more dominant role in? Back and yeah. Well, so first of all, this, we do not have a unified civil service. Uh, we have a lot of uh, congressional, you know, insertion into the actual mechanics of government. A typical parliamentary system in Europe uh, has much less of this kind of problem. Because first of all, a parliamentary system doesn't have a separate president, right? No, I'm sorry, maybe I was asking about the civil society and media. Oh, civil society, yeah. I mean, kind of don't think that they have played a more dominant role in, in, in within that. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, no, that's right, that's right. So actually there's a box down here, well, the citizens box is actually the civil society box, you know, so they are affecting this chain by who they vote for, you know, in terms of elections, but then, you know, they also have a, this is the getting government closer to the people or shorten, shortening the route of accountability. In many countries now, you have things like participatory budgeting where on a municipal level, civil society organizations can see the budget and comment on it. So instead of having to go all the way up here to get accountability, you can try to get direct accountability uh, that way, okay? All right, well, let's, we gotta move along. So, we're done with the economists now, so we're now moving on to the more social capital kind of approach because there's a completely different way of thinking about organizational behavior which isn't related to incentives but is much more related to uh, norms and obviously, you know, human beings have pride, uh, they, uh, they want self-respect, they want recognition, and these are also ways of motivating people. So remember in the discussion about Singapore, we said that their civil servants are paid really high salaries, but even so, they could still make more money in the, in the private sector. So why do people go into the civil service in a place like Singapore? And a lot of it really has to do with things like, you know, self-respect, the prestige of being a public official, you know, that sort of thing. So people are motivated by not just money alone, and that's kind of one of the limitations of a purely economic uh, approach. So you've got this thing um, which is sometimes labeled social capital, which has to do with people's ability to cooperate based on trust, shared norms, you know, shared values, uh, keeping your promises, being reliable uh, and being able to cooperate. And some societies just have more of it than others. Uh, the sources of it are very complicated, could come out of religion. In fact, um, well, so th this is just an illustration of how trust operates, you know, in any society. It's a little bit like the briefing uh, yesterday that any society's got all these networks of trust. So these are individuals and, you know, this may be an ethnic group, this may be a company, this may be a group of alumni of the same educational institution uh, and sometimes they overlap, sometimes they you know, are competitive, but that's what a society is. Uh, and then, you know, the corporate culture is something that overlays, um, it overlays the formal organization of uh, a hierarchy. So, again, this was exactly what, um, you know, 
was being discussed yesterday, you've got these formal sources of authority, but you've also got networks of trust within the organization, uh, norms that bind everybody together. Uh, and if you flatten a, a hierarchy, it depends critically on people at the lower level of the organization trusting each other, being able to share information, not being competitive, uh, and the like. Uh, outsourcing, uh, if outsourcing is going to work, you have to have networks of trust between, you know, the, the, the group to which, whom you're outsourcing and, and you. Uh, and uh, if you think about where social capital comes from, it, it's pretty varied. Uh, in a traditional society, it's very limited because it's based on kinship, religion, shared culture, and the like. In a modern society, uh, a lot of it has to do with professional education, as we were talking about the other day, uh, shared goals and standards that the organization itself can infuse in people, and then things like leadership, all right? So I have now run over by 20 minutes, so um, I had to give a little bit short shrift to this section of it, but the main point is that most of the efforts to reform public sector performance have come under this principal agent framework. Uh, to change incentives or to incentivize people to behave better. Uh, but that's not the only approach. I mean, there's also this approach that is normative. You know, it's based on uh, shaping people's, you know, willingness and, and desire actually to uh, work with other people within the context of a single uh, organization. And that's why people stay late at the office, right? <laughs> uh, if you don't have that kind of shared goal within the organization and you only have incentives, then you're gonna go home when your contract says you get to go home, right? You're not gonna stay late at the office. So I think both of these approaches are kind of important in thinking about organizational behavior. All right, so are there any questions? So let's take 15 minutes and we'll come back and we'll do the Georgia, and then you'll do the discussion questions for the Georgia police reform thing. Again, this is a case that Nino uh, helped us prepare. Uh, it was actually prepared by a Russian guy who's a student of mine back at Stanford. Uh, and it's been extensively vetted by many people in Georgia, but we'll see, what, we'll see how you like it.